Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the panel. Um, this panel is called The Space of Ideas, and it's thinking through uh, the disc world as political, ideological, and physical space. So our first speaker is uh, David Farnell with a paper titled Upside Down, Utopian Critique in Nation. So David Farnell is a professor of English at Fukuoka University in Japan. His research focus is utopian and dystopian themes in literature, and he published papers on such writers as Ursula Le Guin, Herman Melville, Octavia Butler, Margaret Atwood, H.P. Lovecraft, and more, and has also written on folklore and the environment. He is on the editorial boards of Skyhawk, the Journal of the Melville Society of Japan, the Journal of the American Literature Society of Japan, Kyushu American Literature, and Eco-Criticism Review, the Journal of the Society for Eco-Critical Studies Japan. He also writes fantasy and weird fiction. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to David, and uh, thanks very much. Hello, thank you all very much. Um, ah, okay, there we are. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming and um, to the organizers, especially James, for making this happen and, and for having me here. Um, I study utopia. I love Terry Pratchett's work. Uh, every, I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Uh, and uh, for a long time, Pratchett's writings have been in a way a uh, refuge from utopian studies for me. I knew if I was reading or probably uh, rereading um, something of his, I, I would not have a part of my brain going, hmm, how can we take this apart and uh, analyze the utopian and dystopian elements in this and what it says about the real world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, while utopian themes don't jump out as easily from his works as they do with, say, Ursula Le Guin or Margaret Atwood or Ian M. Banks, I don't think it's a great deal of consideration for anyone who comes to Pratchett's works from a scholarly perspective to spot commentary on utopia in them. Ankh-Morpork is a sort of dystopia, a stark and desperate place for most of its inhabitants, if the comedic elements are set aside for the moment. Uh, and definitions of utopia seem to be nearly as numerous uh, as there are uh, scholars, uh, I'm sorry, uh, nearly as numerous as there are scholars of utopia. Um, the, uh, uh, many, uh, many of these definitions include dystopia as a subcategory rather than an antonym. Uh, others see dystopia as almost as a phase, a fertile ground for the birth of utopian dreams. Dystopias critique our world as much as utopias do. Despite having his name on a book called The Long Utopia, Pratchett always seems suspicious of utopias in his works. There's no perfect human society in the Long Earth series. Even the next, the post-humans in the series, have schisms uh, for all their claims to perfection. The trolls, who appear to be the unseen university's librarian, remade into a species, seem closest to having a utopian society. Uh, but they even they face difficulties and predators. For humans, the long earth gives them a chance at utopia, but whether they achieve it or even start to achieve it or even want to achieve it is in question throughout the series. But perfect society is far from the only definition of utopia. While Thomas More's 16th century book, Utopia, where we get the word from, is usually considered a description of an imagined perfect society, it features war and slavery and it outlaws atheism. Um, as many scholars uh, have pointed out over a period of decades, Moore's book also has a strong satirical element. So whether Moore can even consider his utopia to be anything resembling perfect is open to question. More commonly, those who study utopia define it as a radically better society rather than as a perfect one, or at least in the case of achievable real world utopias. Darko Suvam even rejects the radically better label, instead calling utopia the construction of a, a particular community where sociopolitical institutions, norms, and relationships between people are organized according to a radically different principle than the author's community. Michel Foucault, who people have been hooraying and booing in the comments, uh, his term heterotopia is sometimes referred to, is preferred for this sense of utopia, but for this presentation, uh, I had to cut that part. So I'll stick with the more well-known term. 
In this sense, even Ankh Morpork can be considered as utopian as Thomas More's fantasy nation. Pratchett uses satirical utopian spaces um, uh, throughout his work to form critiques of aspects of our world, to call into question conventional wisdom uh, by creating a sense of what Suvan calls cognitive estrangement, which is a brief distancing of the reader from conventional thinking. This is what we see with the Discworld, with its witches and wizards and gods and different ways of policing and ruling, and its different cultures and species that despite their sometimes fantastical or absurd nature, ask us or even give us permission to reconsider whether the way we do things is the best way. Even when the characters of the Discworld don't make the best choices, we see there are other choices that the, than the ones that we keep making. The standalone novel Nation rests in the uh, fuzzy, broad, but liminal space between fantasy and science fiction, mixing realistic and fantastical elements that make it at times almost as fantastical as the Discworld, while also placing it in the science fiction, science fiction subgenre of alternative history. Uh, while the long earth shows us a possible, though not really possible future, Nation presents us with an impossible past but as with the Discworld, the key choices made by characters are not truly impossible, even in our round world present, while shaking us free from the constraining armor of our preconceptions long enough to consider the possibility. The first utopian element is right in the prologue, how, titled How Emo Made the World in the Time When Things Were Otherwise and the Moon Was Different. Here we read a creation myth of the people of the nation, a small island of the great southern Pelagic Ocean, not quite our Pacific Ocean, also known to its people as the island where the sun is born and to British colonizers as an insignificant speck, merely the largest of the mothering Sunday islands, too small to appear in any atlas or to be named after an important holiday. In this myth, Emo, the creator god, whose name recalls blind eel, creates people from the souls of dolphins, but he makes a critical error. He makes the people immortal. This quickly leads to overpopulation and hunger. We can see that the people of the nation already are keenly aware of the dangers of overpopulation, which makes sense for inhabitants of small, ecologically fragile islands. It also makes sense in light of other things as we come to learn about the ancestors of these people. So to correct his mistake, Emo creates Lokaha, the world's death. Like Discworld's death, Lokaha is in some ways wiser than even the greatest of gods, but he is more of a trickster. When Emo decides the world is still flawed, he decides to destroy it and start over with a proper plan. But Lokaha points out that this will kill all the people and asks to be made ruler of the mortal world while Emo makes a true utopia in the sky. Historically, heavens are the earliest utopias that humans have dreamed up, and Lokaha will send those who, uh, be, who uh, have become more than the mud from which they are made and have glorified this mean world by being a part of it through a door into that heaven to live forever as constellations. This utopian myth undergirds the entire novel, and the book comes back to it again and again. In a sense, the prologue is a just so story and ends with, quote, and this is why we are born in water and do not kill dolphins and look at the stars, end quote. But it's also why people die and why the world is mean and why we must make it better. This world is imperfect, but it can be improved. And the belief that the world can be made better than it is through human effort is the core of utopian thought. Non-heavenly utopias also spring from places that are uninhabited or lands whose societies have been wiped away by an apocalypse. We see this commonly in science fiction where empty planets are colonized or ruined lands are rebuilt into near perfection, a guilt-free replay of the horrors of earthly colonialism in which empty lands, which were homes of people who uh, conquered and slaughtered by the guns, germs, and steel of Jared Diamond's popular book, in the case of nation, however, there are two apocalypses going on. One of them is the Russian flu, a pandemic that's crippling Europe, devastating the populace in the same way that European diseases 
devastated the populations of the Americas, Pacific Islands, and other lands in the real world. British royalty is wiped out down to the 138th heir, leaving Henry Fanshawe, a provincial governor of a swath of islands in the great southern Pelagic Ocean, the new king. The other apocalypse is a tsunami, which wipes away the people of the island called Nation, except for Mao, a boy saved for, by being at sea when the wave comes. The entire population of the nation was eagerly waiting for him on the beach to celebrate his return and his manhood rights, and the wave took them all. But it delivers to him a shipwrecked companion, Ermintrude Fanshawe, who had been on her way to join her father, Henry. With the island nearly depopulated, with tradition gone, and the two freed from the bonds of history, they appear ready to create a new society together. Ermintrude even abandons her name and takes a new one, Daphne, to free herself of the grip of her domineering grandmother, as well as the restrictions of her culture and the sorrows of her past. For some time, their only other living companion is a foul-mouthed parrot, another literary connection to the Discworld, in this case to the novel Eric. The parrot acts as a trickster, deflating egos that could hold too tightly to tradition. But the loss of tradition is not only freeing, it's traumatic. Mao is rudderless without the adulthood rights that he had been about to receive, leaving him neither boy nor man, feeling like a little blue crab, a hermit crab caught between shells, vulnerable in his lack of a constricting but protective armor. And of course, the past is just not discarded so easily. As Mao thinks to himself, there are still rules. I brought them with me. They're in my head. I seem to have lost the, um, uh, the uh, slideshow. I don't see it anymore. OK, well, um, he and Daphne are both shaped by their past and their cultures, and much of the novel depicts their struggle to free themselves. But instead, they come to terms with who they have been, who they are, and who they are becoming as the present as well as future dreams shape them just as the past did. Uh, let's see. The slideshow seems to be missing. Ah, oh, there we are. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, ah, okay. Utopias are very often set on islands. Um, let's see. I'm on the wrong slide. Just a moment. There we go. Utopias are very often set on islands. Moore's 16th century kingdom was originally on a peninsula, but the inhabitants dug a wide channel to make it an island. In the 17th century, uh, Francis Bacon's New Atlantis uh, is set on an island, as is Henry Neville's Isle of Pines. And in the 18th century, Jonathan Swift placed his Laputa in the sky. In science fiction, planets take the place of islands. Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy and Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed are two of a multitude of examples. Utopias, whether uh, fictional or real world attempts, require some sort of space apart from the rest of the world, as well as protection to prevent outsiders from interfering. Utopias tend to be vulnerable because they reject violence and armies. We see this in Nation, which is, of course, set on an island. The ocean functions as a natural barrier, keeping Mao and Daphne isolated long enough to bond and learn to rely on each other. Uh, when survivors of other islands begin to trickle in, the young pair are already a team, and despite their youth, they become the center of their community. Utopias are also typically set in places with a natural abundance of resources, and the abundance makes the utopias possible. But some, such as the aforementioned books by Le Guin and Robinson, are set in places with marked scarcity of resources. It's this very scarcity that creates community, which it does in Nation. Um, in Le Guin's The Dispossessed, the citizens of the dry, unforgiving moon Anaris have so little that they have no choice but to work together with little thought of the self just to survive. Similarly, in Robinson's depiction of the settling, terraforming, and eventual independence of Mars, those living on Mars must contend with a deadly environment that forces cooperation, which becomes the underlying ethos of the humans who make Mars their home world. These two stories share another aspect with Nation. They, they both feature small, weak utopias, which could be easily smashed by outside forces if they did not have a natural barrier. But through their 
uh, ability to see new paths, uh, they become saviors of those same threatening forces. In the dispossessed, the utopian moon of Anaris produces science and philosophy that sparks revolution on its much wealthier parent planet. In Mars Trilogy, the hardship of colonizing Mars teaches the lessons the colony need to help rescue Earth when climate change results in environmental catastrophe. And in Nation, Daphne and Mao discover that the islanders are descended from a powerful, science-minded ancient civilization, a sort of Atlantis. And this leads to a flowering of collaboration. When they convince Daphne's father, the new king, not to make the island a colony of England, but rather a member of the Royal Society. Although the novel does not go much, does not go much into the effects of the Russian flu beyond many people died, including most of the royal family, uh, one can imagine that the powerful nations of the world were much weakened and cooperation in rediscovering the ancient sciences of the island where the sun is born may have aided in their recovery. The final chapter makes it clear that the island has become a center of scientific discovery to the benefit of the whole world. Daphne plays a role in the novel that we often see in utopian works, the innocent outsider. I'm really sorry, I couldn't find the artist for this picture, but I love it. Um, she is Moore's narrator, Raphael Hithloday, or Swift's Gulliver, learning about the culture of the nation through Mao and through the survivors from other islands within the nation's cultural influence. She's also familiar or similar to Herman Melville's Tomo from his first novel, Typee, a semi-true account of his time spent as a captive or guest of the Typee people of the island of Nukuhiva in the Marquesas. Pratchett shows that Melville was on his mind with the minor character of Cookie, a sailor who carries with him an ingenious coffin designed to be an emergency survival boat inspired by a harpooner, clearly uh, modeled after Moby Dick's Queequeg. Like Tomo, Daphne be, uh, brings her own viewpoint and like him, she imposes her own social values at times, such as when she convinces Mao and the other islanders to break taboo and enter the cave of the grandfathers. But she's an equal partner to Mao and is changed as much by him as he is by her. Her storyline in the novel is about crossing the beach in the words of Greg, Greg Dinning in his history of the Marquesas Islands. She is shaped by the nation as much as she shapes it, engaging in intercultural transaction rather than being a mere tourist. Her horizons are expanded. Mao too crosses the beach. He changes without losing himself in the face of conquering forces, such as the death worshiping cannibalistic raiders led by Cox or colonizing forces in the form of Daphne's father. As the priest Ataba says to Daphne, and when your father comes in his big boat, what will happen to us then? Ha, you fall silent. You're a good child, the women say, and you do good things. But the difference between the trousermen and the raiders is that sooner or later, the cannibals go away. That's a terrible thing to say, said Daphne hotly. We don't eat people. There are different ways to eat people, girl, and you are clever. Oh yes, clever enough to know it. And sometimes the people don't realize it's happened until they hear the belch. Melville saw Taipivai, the valley where he lived for a little while, as an Edenic utopian society. Throughout his novel, he raved of the perfection of life there, aside from a little cannibalism and some confusing rules, and he considered it radically better than Western civilization. Contact with the Western world, however, resulted in a massive population drop, primarily from disease, something replicated across Polynesia. Utopia rarely survives contact with the outside world unless it can be strengthened and prepared. Mao's world has been destroyed. Everything he knew is called into question. He spends most of the novel in a high functioning traumatized state, even at one point nearly dying of mental and physical exhaustion. His world is turned upside down and he must fight to write it and find his place in it. He asks Daphne, why are you so much smarter than us? He loses faith in the importance of his people. And for a time, he wears sailor's trousers. Daphne shows him 
among the artifacts of the ancient civilization from which the nation descends, a globe with the South Pole at the top, and a land as big as Crete, where the nation and its archipelago is now. She shows him that his ancestors were great explorers and scientists long before Europe was freed from the Ice Age. We've all seen maps meant to shake us free of set beliefs. When I was a child, the standard map in my classrooms was one that centered North America. And that in flattening the uh, globe made the lands of the Southern Hemisphere look tiny and that split Asia from Europe. There are many ways to display the world and these ways can change the way we see it. Shaken free of past beliefs, uh, Mao is able to access this, uh, accept this new information along with what he's learned of Daphne's world and use it to envision a path. Mao has always seen a silver thread that pulled him toward the future he pictured in his head. In the final chapter, an old man that I like to picture as the great Southern Pelagic Oceans version of Terry Pratchett himself says, everything I know makes me believe emo is in the order which is inherent amazingly in all things and in the way the universe opens to our questioning. When I see the shining path over the lagoon on an evening like this at the end of a good day, I believe. That silver thread, the, that shining path, Utopia is not a place at all. It's a place, a, a path, a series of actions of never ending. Uh, so Ruth Levitas calls Utopia a method. She writes, Utopia is about the imaginary reconstitution of society. Ernst Bloch calls it the not yet. To Levitas, Utopia is a method. To Bloch, it's a dream, a necessary dream without which the world would never improve in real world ways. Pratchett detects it, depicts it as a thread or a path. The novel sees this also in a many worlds vision, similar to that a longer series here and there in Discworld series as well. Before Daphne must sacrifice her freedom and her desire to stay with Mao in order to return to England and be a princess, uh, he tells her that there are other worlds and that we can, all the things uh, can be true. There will be no unhappy memories. And I think I need to wrap up there. Gurev, ma'agut, mahalo. And thank you all very much. Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, James and Co. Correct me if this is the wrong <laughs> moment for me to pop back in, but uh, yes, as James said in the chat, please post your questions. Um, but I. Until we get some, I'll start with just an initial question, uh, you, David. Um, do you see a sort of move towards utopia throughout Terry Pratchett's of in general? You know, Nathan is one of the later works, um, relatively late, you know, more recent works. Um, can you identify a trend or thinking through the ideas of utopia um, in his in his works? Hmm. So, um, you know, Okay, yeah, so a, a trend of a uh, trend toward utopia in his works. I haven't actually thought about that in terms of time so much. Um, I'm trying to uh, think of exactly uh, uh, where nation appears. I think it appeared before the uh, the fourth uh, Tiffany aching novel. Um, and I think like in the uh, uh, Tiffany aching stories, uh, I think that uh, Utopia uh, was shown as like the um, uh, the fairy world in the first Tiffany Aching novel, a perfect world, but uh, a terrible place. Um, and we see that a lot, especially whenever it comes to the Fae in Terry Pratchett. Um, and so he, 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 do, he does have that suspicion of Utopia, I think. As far as moving more and more toward it, I'm... I just I just keep seeing uh, elements of it throughout, but I'm sorry I haven't really considered very well about it in uh, like placing the novels in time. So I I have a hard time saying whether or not there was. Sorry about that. No, no, no problem. It's just uh, just a uh, um, just something I thought might be interesting. We have a question from the chat. Um, has there been any indigenous slash post-colonial criticism or analysis of nation? 
and that you're aware of or that you've encountered in your research any of particular you know that go into particular depth right um you know i uh uh, I didn't come across any while I was researching for this. If anybody has uh, done so, uh, I would love to read it because there's quite a lot of uh, post-colonial and uh, indigenous criticism of Melville uh, and that I've encountered in the past. So I, uh, uh, I would love to make connections between those. I'm afraid that, uh, uh, yeah, I wasn't able to find any uh, for nation uh, during my research. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, thank you for the for the comment there about the placing it. Right. Um, are there any other questions from chat? Let me see. Um, yes. So somebody somebody asked, uh, would you say the same understanding of utopia can be applied to the Tiffany Aching series? But um, obviously, mm. you, you just touched on that. Um, we have another. Yeah, I th I th yes. Yeah, I think it's very negative view of utopia in the Tiffany yeah. Aching series. Sure. Although the, the chalk could be argued as a sort of utopia, though it's not really though. There's a there's child abuse and other things going on. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'm. Uh, someone asks. I'm wondering about Pratchett's changing view of utopia. Oh wow! The chat's blowing up. <laughs> and yeah. shown in yeah. his increasing dislike for Captain Carrot. Oh wait, this isn't the question. Never mind. Oh. That serves me right for not reading to the end of the sentence. Okay, an actual question, <laughs> uh, as opposed to an interesting observation. I recently read some which about utopias and also socio-technical imaginaries. Do you have any thoughts on how Pratchett's utopian themes could link to how technology develops in the disc world? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, the that actually yes, actually that that makes me think about how you uh, disc world is in a way moving toward utopia. Uh, in the later novels, especially the Moist von Lipwig novels, uh, where uh, you know we see all of these improvements, and there are problems. Certainly, the clacks create problems. Stamps, uh, uh, you know, having mail going and so on, uh, is shown as a very good thing, which, uh, as an American, I uh, really uh, am very concerned about right at the moment uh, that the mail keeps going, um, and the um, uh, you know, banks, uh, are banks a utopian thing? Well, they are shown to have some good uh, good sides to them in, uh, in the novel. Uh, so I don't know if they're really utopian, but it is the changing of society uh, that uh, really can make people, you know, well, I mean, it's going to give some, some big benefits to some people. And it also shows us ways in which we could have handled it differently. For sure. Uh, another question asks, um, are there echoes of Shakespeare's Tempest in Nation, given that Pratchett often reimagines Shakespearean plays in his Discworld novels? Do you think something similar is happening with Nation? I hadn't thought about that. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, there's, there's really no wizard character, uh, you know, uh, 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 to, to take the, uh, sort of lead role in Tempest. And there's, uh, uh, although you do have the uh, uh, the scientist at the end, the one who I identify with uh, Pratchett. Um, and of course, Cox is a, uh, you know, uh, has his, uh, Cox and his men have their parallels in Tempest. So yeah, I find that really interesting. I'm not a Shakespearean, uh, but uh, I would really love to see somebody uh, examine a uh, nation from a Shakespearean perspective. All right, you heard it. You heard it here first, everyone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> question: Would you say this is this is interesting? Would you say that Terry Pratchett's utopia was an ideal of self, or idea of self, rather than a physical place or a location of community? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I, I I was kind of talking about that a little bit. Then I got a message that I needed to wrap it up, and I wasn't <laughs> sure if I needed to wrap it up immediately or if I had a few minutes. So I just wrapped it up. Uh, and uh, so what I, uh, what I was uh, going to talk about was that, um, uh, you know, th this idea of utopia as a path, as a method, as an action or a series of actions, and, and as a dream. And so I think that um, 
you know, from Ernst Bloch, uh, uh, he, he was a, uh, kind of Christian mystic communist, uh, 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 philosopher. And he saw utopia as primarily a dream and utopian dreaming is, is extremely, uh, important, uh, uh, that without utopian dreaming, we would not be able to improve the world. Uh, and so he really places utopia as a virtual uh, thing, something that doesn't really ever really happen in the real world. Uh, whereas somebody like Ruth Levitas doesn't demand that utopia be perfect, but uh, just that that utopian dreaming must result in actions which uh, lead to improvements. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of um, the ones who walk away from Omelas, of course, as uh, oh, yeah. you sort of yeah. brought mind is what kind of price is paid it's just just a mm. i think thing and in K, set off. Uh, yes and and in k jemison's uh sequel uh the yes. ones who stay and fight what a wonderful yes, story exactly. that is exactly yeah. <clears throat> okay let me see lots of questions coming in uh how do you oh wait no i missed one so in nation religion versus rationality is discussed what do you think was pratchett's position on that if we uh, sort of take that into account in light of the rest of his work <clears throat> i um i always get the feeling from pratchett that while he was an atheist and i mean i don't know him i don't know enough about him his personal life to say for sure, but I always get the feeling from reading his fiction that while he was an atheist, he had a, a great respect for the need to believe. And uh, we see this also in all of his uh, uh, statements about the need for stories, and even in a uh, nation, the need for lies, the necessary lies to help people go on and, uh, and, uh, and so on, yes. So yes, I agree with Eve, uh, humanist rather than atheist. That that is a good way of putting it. Uh, and uh, his, you know, his uh, that final character, that uh, unnamed old man who I think of as Pratchett, uh, seems to me uh, to be making a very profound statement about seeing emo in the order of things. Uh, not necessarily believing emo is a real god, but just uh, seeing that the numinous in uh, uh in the order of things uh, the the book makes uh uh so many uh references to um uh, i'm sorry i'm i've been i i'm having uh, sir isaac newton i i almost i almost said a completely different philosopher's name uh so. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you Another question asks, how do you think Pratchett's view of the utopian style of justice changes in his novels? Oh, okay. Oh, utopian, the utopian style of justice? Is that what you said? Yep. That was the okay. uh, that was question from the chat. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I mean, he, uh, just, Terry Pratchett is very concerned with justice uh, throughout his novels. Uh, we see that. Uh, you know, very strongly through characters like Vimes. Uh, and justice is important in uh, Nation as well. Uh, when, uh, uh, when Daphne kills in uh, not exactly self-defense, uh, she orders them to put her on trial, orders the people of the nation to put her on trial because that's just the way things must be done. And she has to spend quite a lot of time arguing them into it. Uh, to get them to do it. Um, so, yeah, he, it's really, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he struggles with what justice should be and trying to uh, put it into uh, effect. And yes, a very good quote there. Everyone loves to see justice done on somebody else. Uh, and, and put it into, uh, or express it in through many different characters uh, and different characters' views of it, which I guess, you know, you could say are all views that he may have had himself or views that he wants to argue against. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, a niche question coming up. Would you regard the glorious People's Republic of Tranquil Mine Road in Nightwatch to be a potential utopia, even if it only exists for the smallest of temporal bubbles? Oh my gosh. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, I I haven't read Night Watch in years and years, and I believe I I can't uh, remember any details about the Glorious People's Republic. Oh, right, right, right. No, I'm remembering now. I'm remembering now. Okay, yes, right. It is a yeah, the, the brief-lived movement. Uh, yes. Well, there. It's an attempt at utopia, and uh, and of course, it's poking. I think it's poking fun at utopia. Uh, there. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Oops. Um, okay. So we have a comment. Uh, Vetinari makes a great comment about progress being achieved by people pulling in all different directions at once, sort of hinting at a utopia that is inherently messy, complicated, and imperfect. Uh, and um, I'm curious about how this might fit in with the more academic sort or uh, conceptualizations of utopia. Well, <laughs> it, 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 it's a dynamic, you know, if there is, is that binary? Yeah, I mean, it is a, it is a rare form of utopia, but it exists uh, in a way uh, uh, Ian Banks's culture uh, has that sort of utopia. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, uh, oh, yes, I, I love the concept of hope punk. Mm. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, yes, the, the idea that, yes, it's all very messy. Everything's pulling in different directions in Ankhmo Fork. But, oh, I'm hearing myself. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, uh, it's all orchestrated by Vetinari. Uh, Vetinari is, uh, is manipulating all of that at the same time. So I don't think it's really quite the kind of uh, natural chaos, you know, utopia arriving out of chaos that we might uh, uh, come up with, yeah. Hmm. Oh, I was just looking at uh, Aishwara's uh, uh, chat, yeah. I think I've covered the question. If anybody has a question I've missed, feel free to um, just repost. Uh, did you want to did you want to say a little bit about, more about Hope Punk, uh, David? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'm, I'm quite a fan of Hope Punk. Uh, just just uh, uh, a uh, an anthology on it that I was uh, backing on Kickstarter just got funded. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I agree, Naomi, uh, that it's something you have to keep working on, not an endpoint. And that's that's really, uh, I was, I was uh, trying to talk about that right at the end and cut out most of it. Uh, but um, uh, the idea that, that, yeah, it's not a place. It's something you do. That's what utopia is. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I think we've got, we've got a couple minutes left. So if there are any uh, last minute questions that anybody is dying to ask them, please do uh, pop them in the chat. Ah, oh, there's a question. Okay, there is one. <laughs> Would yeah. you read this about a perfect utopia? A cocaine. Uh, yeah, I think that's how it's pronounced. Cocaine, which I think it's just a, uh, uh, at least that's how I've heard it pronounced. Uh, and I think it's just a uh, coincidence that maybe that it sounds like uh, the drug, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, a, a perfect utopia. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of them. Uh, there's ones like the Big Rock Candy Mountain and and things like that. These are more uh, fairy tales, uh, or afterlives, or uh, songs, or things like that. They're usually not going to be novels. There might mm -hmm. be like brief little descriptions of them, or or things like that. They'll be in legends, but generally in novels, you don't really have uh, perfect utopias because mm -hmm. they would really be boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even help. even Ian Bank uh, talks about the mainly about the edges of his utopia, not the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we go. Uh, We've got the etymology of cocaine in the chat. Okay. Thank you, Devin. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you think would happen to Ankh-Morpork Pork after the passing of Veterinary and Vimes? Oh, I don't like to think about it. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm hoping that Veterinary would actually set things up so that um, after him would not come the flood. Uh, that, uh, uh, and I think that's what he's doing. I think that's what he's doing with backing uh, Moist von Litvig and, uh, uh, and Vimes and getting, the, uh, uh, getting things set up the way he is. He is kind of devolving his powers to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, kind of in the same way that the say the king of uh, Bhutan, uh, uh, you know, decided that no, we need a parliament, and I shouldn't have absolute power, and so he started giving his power to other branches of government and so on, and slowly uh, making moving away from an absolute monarchy that they had a few decades ago. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, I think I've got time for one more question. So, uh, let me see, did I miss one, did I miss one? Okay, someone asked earlier about the idea of a uh, benevolent dictatorship being a utopia. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, we see that with uh, with Vimes. Uh, I'm sorry, how do I say Vimes? Vetinari. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, although he's a little bit of a benevolent dictator as well, mm -hmm. uh, within a little subsection of utopia. Um, but uh, of Ankh Morpork, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with Chris there, who just mentioned before about uh, that, that uh, Terry Pratchett needs great men in a lot of his worlds. Uh, and so this, uh, uh, yeah, benevolent dictatorship is really, really common in utopias uh, up until quite mm -hmm. recently. And a lot of the science fictional ones are not. And in fact, many science fictional ones that are benevolent dictatorships usually turn out to be dystopias they usually fall apart um but yeah, yeah. it's a it's a very common theme in in utopian fiction mm -hmm. okay uh, i think that's all we've got time for for the q a thank you um to everyone for your great questions and thank you again to david farnell for his excellent paper